So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, for joining us uh, to uh, uh, hear uh, what Professor uh, Simon Chesterman uh, uh, is going to uh, explain to us about his uh, uh, book, uh, We uh, the Robots Regulating Artificial Intelligence uh, and the Limits of Law, which I've got uh, in, the, in the Kindle version. We also have a, a printed copy, but uh, my reading is a process of creative destruction. So I went through the, uh, through the Kindle version. Uh, without further ado, let me just uh, uh, introduce Pro Professor Chesterman to you. Uh, Professor Chesterman uh, is uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Law at the National University of Singapore, our sister a friend uh, institution uh, uh, in, in Singapore. He's also the, the university's uh, provost, uh, and he's a senior director of AI governance at AI Singapore. Um, he has been educated in Melbourne, Beijing, Amsterdam, uh, and Oxford, uh, and he has taught in places as diverse as Melbourne, Oxford, Southampton, Columbia, and uh, CS Paul. Uh, uh, and what I think is particularly interesting uh, uh, in, uh, in the book uh, and uh, in Professor Chesterman's career, uh, he has published is that he has published widely uh, uh, in aspects of public law, including uh, in issues related to international humanitarian law. He has an, uh, he has experienced uh, at, at the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs uh, in Yugoslavia. Uh, in the International Criminal Tribunal for Ru Rwanda. So he's, he brings this wealth uh, of experience uh, in the area of public law, uh, which uh, is particularly helpful for the angle uh, that he, he brings uh, to the argument uh, in his book. Uh, questions concerning the role of the state uh, in regulation, uh, questions concerning the limits uh, of law, morality, legitimacy, uh, which are at the heart of the discussions uh, and which I'm uh, more than happy uh, to uh, give the floor uh, to Professor Chasteman now. So uh, he engages with us uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, in relation to his very uh, uh, interesting and uh, uh, eloquent uh, and exciting uh, uh, book. Uh, so without further ado, Professor Chesterman, we are delighted to have you here. Thanks so much, Marcelo, for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, and as you say, the, the, the ties between Singapore and Hong Kong, between NUS and Hong Kong University are very strong. Uh, there has been the dangling prospect of a travel bubble, making it easier to travel um, between our two locations. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there in person, uh, but I'm very grateful for the warm welcome. Uh, and the people who've, uh, who've come to, uh, to hopefully be provoked to engage in conversation. But your kind of, your description of my background really does perhaps raise in some people's minds the question, why is this public international lawyer writing about technology law? And the arc I think you've already highlighted is that I've always been interested in public authority in crisis. Uh, and so my doctoral thesis was on humanitarian intervention what can and should outside actors do if a state turns on its own population? I've done work on post-conflict reconstruction. What role could the international community play uh, if there is a dearth of state or state institutions? Um, in the national security sphere, how should states respond uh, to threats to the institutions of the state? Uh, and the more I looked at technology over the past decade, the more I realized that there are aspects of technology, but in particular, modern artificial intelligence that challenge the very idea of public authority, uh, in particular challenge notions of regulation, by which I mean public control of a set of activities that, as in the case of AI, have the potential for enormous benefit, uh, but also for risks as well. Uh, and so what I'll do is talk for 15, 20 minutes about the, the book, and then I'm really looking forward to engaging with you, Marcelo, but also all the people who are listening in, uh, who I think can enter questions through the Q&A function, uh, and hopefully we're going to have a kind of uh, discussion like that. Uh, and I've put in a chat a link. If, if you're bored or if you've already decided you want to go and buy the book, you can you can find information there. So this, this is the title. Um, and I've got these two hats that are relevant. Uh, one is obviously in a law school and AI Singapore is a, a kind of interdisciplinary uh, project, a national level institution in Singapore 
where I'm heading a new AI governance pillar, which is looking at two broad questions. One is uh, the sort of, should we trust artificial intelligence? The, the reliability, the trustworthiness question, very much along the lines of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, but the second thing we're also looking at uh, is a much more amorphous set of questions about will humans in fact trust artificial intelligence and how do we manage that human machine interaction? Uh, and that's maybe something we could talk about uh, in discussion. But we start with a bit of history. So this is a uh, famous, uh, well, among computer scientists, famous photo of the 1956 Dartmouth conference or workshop at which the term artificial intelligence is widely believed to have been coined. Uh, and it's striking for a couple of reasons. The two I'll highlight. One is the complete lack of diversity, basically a bunch of white men sitting around talking about this issue. Uh, and diversity is a challenge for artificial intelligence all the way through today. Uh, not just the people who are doing it, but the subject matter uh, of, uh, of the data sets that are used. So that's one thing to observe. Uh, the second thing is that these guys got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation on the basis of a short proposal, essentially promising that if the Rockefeller Foundation funded them for a summer, in a couple of months, they thought they could solve most of the problems of AI. Uh, and that points to a second problem that artificial intelligence has had, in addition to diversity, it's the mismanagement of expectations as we go through a, a kind of surge of enthusiasm and then a crash of disappointment in what has become known as AI winters. So managing expectations about what AI can achieve. Something that happened not long after this uh, was uh, a few years later, uh, we have 2001, the novel by Arthur C. Clarke, the film by Stanley Kubrick. Um, and this really epitomized for many the fears of this new technology. Uh, and if you've seen the film, probably you can recall the chilling words of Hal, the artificially intelligent system in the, in the, on a spaceship, explaining why its orders were more important than the lives of its crew. Uh, and that really epitomizes some of the fears of AI taking decisions at the expense of humans um, and, uh, and indeed taking over control of certain parts or in the entire world uh, from humans. So this kind of fear of technology is pretty common with new technologies. It's not unusual for people to express concern. What is a bit unusual about artificial intelligence is that some of the starkest warnings have come not from the lunatic fringe, but from people who really do know what they're talking about. People like Elon Musk, Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking. Elon Musk, among others, has put more than $10 million of his own money into research to trying to ensure that AI does not become an immortal dictator. So there is clearly something here. There is, there is uh, enormous opportunity offered by AI, but there's also risk. Uh, and that's really the departure point for my, my work. But what are we talking about? Artificial intelligence, I'm using a pretty broad term uh, to denote um, computer systems, other systems that effectively take on cognitive functions that would normally be performed by a human. That is the thinking tasks that would normally be given to a human. I am talking about narrow artificial intelligence rather than general artificial intelligence. Most AI tends to be pretty much focused on a specific set of activities. Artificial general intelligence raises the idea of super intelligence. We, we can talk about that in conversation, but I think for the next decade or two, uh, narrow artificial intelligence will keep us pretty busy. Machine learning uh, denotes the ability of a computer system or other system to improve on its own behavior without additional input from a human. Robotics is how the, all these things engage with the world. Uh, if you combine AI and machine learning, you get things like the uh, AlphaGo, the, uh, the Go playing uh, system developed by Google and others uh, that defeated world champion Lee Sudol back in 2016. You combine AI and robotics, you get things like autopilot. You combine machine learning and robotics, you get things like uh, the Roomba, uh, this vac automatic vacuum cleaner that can learn the contours of your house. So that's a bit of definitions. What, what is the problem that I'm identifying? I've said that there is a challenge that artificial intelligence poses to regulators, to regulation. Why? Uh, and this, I hope, is one of the contributions of the book, is to clarify precisely where that challenge lies. And I, I put it into three broad baskets. The first is speed, uh, that computer systems can do things faster than humans, and this poses regulatory challenges really at a practical level rather than a conceptual one. Uh, an example of this is the so-called flash crash from 11 years ago, when uh, in the space of about 30 minutes, a trillion dollars was wiped off the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, and then in the next 15 minutes, most of it came back and no one knew why at the time. 
And ultimately it was, it's actually a bit more complicated than this, but a lot of it boiled down to high frequency trading algorithms that were trading with one another faster than humans ever could uh, that spiraled out of control. Uh, and so securities regulation required amendments to address this. Uh, there are similar challenges in areas like um, competition law, where the uh, ability of humans to collude, if two humans got together and negotiated on the price, that might be uh, collusion in violation of anti, anti uh, in, in violation of competition law. Uh, but if two machines do it, they might do it logically without any meeting of the minds, thus creating a problem that competition law needs to resolve. So that's one challenge, speed. Not really conceptual challenges, but practical challenges to effective regulation. The second is autonomy. And we tend to talk about autonomy a lot. The, the easiest example is a driverless car, perhaps. And so this raises the question in some people's minds that if, uh, if a driverless car injures someone, who is to blame? Um, now, this isn't actually that new a problem for uh, the law. If, for example, if I'm driving and I carelessly drive into Marcelo and injure him, I might be liable. If I, if I injure him because my car blows up, the manufacturer of the car might be liable. Uh, and what we're seeing in artificial intelligence in the area of driverless cars is most likely what will be a move from responsibility of drivers to responsibility of manufacturers. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not even a complicated thing uh, in terms of the civil law. Where it does become a little bit more complicated is criminal law, where if I drive through a red light, I'm criminally responsible, I might get a fine. Uh, but if an autonomous vehicle does, then it raises legitimate questions about why we would be fining it. I mean, the reason why we impose a fine on me as a driver is to educate me, is to deter other people like me and so on. But those reasons might make less sense for a computer system. So this is the second basket of challenges in terms of autonomy. The third is opacity. Now, opacity is not, not that new either. There are plenty of examples of systems and uh, practices where the uh, inner workings are not always clear for different reasons. Um, an old one is uh, because some technologies, for example, are proprietary. So certain software systems might be closed to outside observers because that's the way the programmers wanted it to be. Uh, because they've invested in technology, they don't want people prying in. Law can deal with this through court order, through subpoenas, uh, and you can break into it in that sense. A second type of opacity is just complexity, that some things are hard to understand. This is also not that new. Modern pharmaceuticals, modern technology often requires experts to testify in court, uh, experts to be drawn upon by regulators. Uh, that's also not that unusual, and there are ways of dealing with it, as I said, through expert witnesses and so on. Where things do become a little bit more complicated is in areas where natural le uh, machine learning um, processes are now sometimes what's called naturally opaque. That is, they are so complex that not even the most expert human can understand them. They are impossible for a human to understand. Uh, and that does raise challenges because accountability, responsibility presumes the ability to attribute wrongdoing. And it's hard to attribute wrongdoing if you don't understand how a decision was made. Now, again, this is not always a problem. Uh, we don't demand understanding of every aspect of our lives. I mean, had I the opportunity to fly to Hong Kong, um, the fact that I'm not an aeronautics engineer and don't understand all of the niceties of jet propulsion wouldn't prevent me getting on an aeroplane. Uh, we routinely use medical technology, pharmaceuticals, medical treatments, where we don't understand at a molecular level exactly what's going on. But if you translate that into a legal context, if, for example, a judge is making a decision, then we really do want to understand how she or he is making that decision uh, in order for it to be legitimate. So that's the third basket of, of issues around uh, uh, the problem that AI poses for uh, legal systems and for regulators. Now, for a long time, we didn't get much further than this guy in terms of addressing these problems. And some of you might recognize Isaac Asimov, who in 1942 published a uh, short story called Runaround, where he introduced what was called the, third, the three laws of robotics. And this was the source of, of a whole series of interesting science fiction stories. But it's kind of an indictment of our efforts to regulate technology, that for almost 70 years, we didn't get much further than this. Um, it's an indictment in two ways. First, because it misunderstands his literary legacy, that the reason Asimov was a good writer, the reason his stories were interesting, was because his laws didn't work. If they'd worked, his career would have been very brief. 
and indeed many of his stories are about conflicts between these laws. That's linked with the second uh, problem with his legacy, uh, which is that thinking of the problem of regulating artificial intelligence as the need to come up with new laws misunderstands the problem as being both too hard and too easy. It misunderstands it as being too hard because it presumes you've got to reinvent all these wheels. You've got to come up with entirely new laws, rules, principles, frameworks, when in fact um, the, our existing laws are for the most part, not entirely, but for the most part, perfectly capable of dealing with a lot of autonomous activity. Um, it misunderstands the problem as being too easy because the assumption is if you could only come up with the perfect list, then applying it would be a piece of cake. When in fact, it's the other way around. You don't need to come up with the list the real challenge is, however, how it applies in practice. Nonetheless, there's been a flurry of activity in this area, in particular over the last five years. Uh, and this is just a survey of some of the hundreds and hundreds of principles, guides, ethical positions, frameworks, um, lists of rules. Some come up, some brought up by individual companies, some by countries, some by industry consortia. The Pope signed on to one last year. There's a whole range of these things. And the timing is interesting. Partly it's linked with the, uh, the emergence of certain forms of technology, uh, but it's also because the consequences of technology have become much clearer to us in the last five years in particular. And it's striking that it was in the first half of 2018 that the details of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, this is the, the misuse of data on Facebook that arguably played a role in uh, transforming the 2016 US presidential election. That six month period is also when Google, Facebook, IBM, Microsoft all came up with ethical principles and frameworks precisely because they started to realize the real world consequences of this activity uh, and the need to guard against it, or at least to get ahead of regulators before regulators started limiting their ability to, uh, to conduct business the way they would like to. So if you go through those hundreds of principles, I don't recommend it, but I have, if you go through them, you end up with broadly six overlapping uh, ideas none of which is particularly hard to uh, agree with, human control, transparency, safety, accountability, non-discrimination, privacy, all good things that I, I would certainly welcome AI systems complying with. The more interesting question though is, do we actually need these new principles or are they just wheels being reinvented? Safety in particular, basically is a way of saying product liability rules should apply. Accountability is another way of saying civil and criminal law should apply. You shouldn't be able to do through a machine, something that you couldn't do yourself. Non-discrimination, uh, that human rights or uh, rights protections should apply. Privacy, most of our jurisdictions, certainly Hong Kong and Singapore have data protection laws. Uh, an AI system should be bound by the same laws that you and I and every corporation is bound by. I do think there is something though in human control and transparency that is a little bit different. Uh, and human control in particular, uh, does raise the question of whether there should be limits on AI research, whether there should be red lines. Uh, and in the book, I argue for two kinds of red lines on human control. Um, the first is on life and death decisions in particular. Lethal autonomous weapons is, uh, is the, the most obvious category. That the transfer of decision-making in terms of targeting decisions from humans to robots shouldn't happen. That should be a red line. Uh, and maybe we can talk about that in, in discussion if people are interested. Um, the second red line in human control is that we shouldn't be producing uncontrollable, uncontainable AI systems. Now, this is some way off into the future, the prospect of a, an artificial general intelligence, but we've already seen what can happen when viruses run loose, run loose not just pandemic type viruses, but computer viruses. So there should be rules that constrain uh, the ability to, to release such things into the wild if they're, gonna, if they're going to get out of control. So that's one limitation, human control. And then the second is on the area of transparency, that if we're gonna have meaningful regulation, we need to be able to understand these systems. And that's not just in the context of say, the, the European Union's right to an explanation, which is a quite narrow way of understanding transparency. Transparency must mean more than just being able to ask for reasons when you don't get what you want. Uh, because that's only a tiny part of the universe of decisions that might be made by AI systems. Uh, transparency in some areas, in particular in governmental decisions, uh, requires not just that we get an explanation for a particular decision, but that we are able to understand the basis for all the decisions that affect rights and obligations. So what happens in, in terms of regulation? And here I'll talk about why to regulate, 
when to regulate and how to regulate. But first on the why question, why or why not regulate? Um, we do so for a couple of reasons in general. We try and address market failures, so we don't want losses to land unfairly. So to pick the example of autonomous vehicles, uh, you want to make sure that people aren't unnecessarily bearing the costs of AI systems uh, damage. Uh, we sometimes, however, do regulate in support of social or other policies. And this is a reason why we might prohibit AI bias, that even if it was efficient to be biased or to discriminate against a particular category of people, women, men, people of color, people of particular sex, dual orientation and so on, uh, we might not want to do that. Uh, and that's where society usually draws a kind of red line. But there are also reasons why we might want to think carefully about regulating. Uh, one concern is that you can constrain innovation or you can lose your competitive advantage. Uh, and so Singapore, for example, two years ago, had a review of the penal code that explicitly concluded that we did not want to criminalize certain AI conduct, conduct for fear that it would drive innovation elsewhere. And there are plenty of examples of this. Uh, if you think back 20 years to the, the George W. Bush administration in the United States, there was a prohibition, a moratorium rather, on stem cell research, the prime consequence of which was it drove stem cell research out of the, Uni out of the United States into other jurisdictions. But we're seeing at the moment a real division between different uh, jurisdictions where in the US, it's very much a market-driven approach. Europe has embraced very much a, a human rights-led approach uh, to uh, the, the question of data protection and AI, which has been very influential. And until recently, I would have said China had a particular focus on sovereignty and national security with a lot of emphasis on um, data localization. But even in China, there's been a, a move to greater degrees of regulation this year uh, in the form of the personal information protection law, uh, and efforts to rein in tech companies. But we're seeing a real experimentation in terms of different approaches to the, the issue of why we might regulate. What about when? So this is um, a wonderful uh, uh, idea that was posed some 30 years ago by Collingridge, what's now called the Collingridge Dilemma. Uh, and what he was referring to in a book on, um, uh, on technology and social change is that at an early stage of technology's development, it's easy to regulate but you don't know what to do. The longer you wait, the more you understand the consequences and the problems that you're trying to address, but the harder it is to regulate. Uh, and so this is a real dilemma. If you, if you start regulating now, for example, we might either drive innovation elsewhere or we might impose artificial costs. So um, to deal with this, um, people in environmental law will be very familiar with this, which is the precautionary principle. That's the idea that if there's a serious risk of something, uh, then the fact that scientific knowledge is uncertain shouldn't stop you guarding against that. That's a little bit easier in the environmental context where the objectives are clearer. It's a bit harder to apply in the context of AI. Uh, a different approach is what uh, a minister in Singapore quoted as uh, being masterly inactivity, which is a way of saying, I'm not going to do anything, but I'm looking very closely. And so Singapore and some other jurisdictions have had interesting experiments uh, looking at uh, the, uh, the use of sandboxes, for example, regulatory sandboxes for fintech so that uh, financial technology companies can do can offer products to consumers, uh, but with limited risk without at the same time taking on all of the onus of, uh, of particular forms of regulation. What about the how question, how we, how we approach regulation? Well, unfortunately, very often, this is uh, really focused on the supply side. People say, right, I've got a toolbox of regulation. How am I going to apply this to uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, and my, I make an argument that I think we need to look more at the demand side. We need to think more carefully about why we're regulating. The reason being that there are at least three different reasons for regulating AI uh, that will lead you in slightly different directions depending on the context. The first is there are some situations where we just want to manage the risk. We want to get the benefits and reduce the harms. So in the context of autonomous vehicles, for example, um, I don't actually think it's a moral question whether the taxi I get into has a human driver or an AI system. I just want it to be safe. Uh, if people are very interested, we can talk about trolley problems in the Q&A, uh, but this is a simple, broadly a simple question of um, uh, utilitarian optimization. How do we get the benefits while minimizing the risks? So that, that's reasonably simple, I think. Um, Slightly harder, different questions are in the context of, uh, of uh, areas where it's not just that we want the best outcome, we want a human making the decision. 
And this maybe takes me back to the question of lethal autonomous weapons. But occasionally people argue that you shouldn't deploy lethal autonomous weapons like a drone or a robot soldier into the field because they are incapable of making battlefield decisions, discriminating between civilian and combatant, um, minimizing harm and so on, military necessity, that a robot can't make as good a decision as a human. That's a pretty terrible argument uh, because if there's one thing that machines are very quickly improving at, it's categorization questions. Uh, and if there's one thing that the history of war crimes tells you, it's that most of the crimes or a great many of the crimes take place because humans get tired, angry, uh, racist, sexist, and so on. Uh, precisely the things that machines are designed to avoid. So I don't think it's a winning argument to say that machines should not be making life or death decisions because they will make inferior decisions. Um, I think the compelling argument is that machines should not be making those decisions, not because of a kind of utilitarian calculus, that's when you're managing risk, but for deontological reasons, fundamental questions of right and wrong that are not tied to the consequences, but are tied to the processes. So a human should make a decision whether to kill person A or person B, not because he or she is gonna make a better decision necessarily, but because he or she will then grapple with that decision in a moral way that is impossible for a robot, at least at the moment, and he or she can be held accountable for that decision in a way that a robot cannot be. There's a third category of cases where it's not just a matter of optimization or any old human making a decision. It's that in some situations, a particular human should make a decision. Uh, and this, I give the example of a judge, that the reason why we empower judges to make decisions of right and wrong, of uh, penalty or not penalty, who gets custody of whose children, is not because they're geniuses. I mean, our law schools train them to be good, competent individuals. They're selected because of their ability. But it is their role within a hierarchy. It is their role within a politically accountable uh, set of structures uh, that means that their decision is legitimate um, because either it's subject to review by a, a superior body or because it's at the top of the, of the pinnacle that's gone through a series of reviews. Uh, and so, again, we're not making judges empowered to, to take these decisions because they're necessarily perfect, but because they exist within a hierarchy where they are politically accountable for those decisions, at least in an ideal situation. So I'm getting towards the end. This is not theoretical. Um, European Union earlier this year did uh, um, adopt a, a draft regulation looking at regulating AI that came just in time before my book went to press. So there are a couple of footnote references to it. It's in draft at the moment. And there's a lot of discussion about uh, the European views of uh, regulation of facial surveillance and so on, sentiment analysis. But almost immediately after this draft regulation was proposed, someone came back and said, no, this is going to cost billions of dollars because it will just drive AI innovation elsewhere. So that's one set of debates. Um, more recently, last month, um, one of the things I talk about is robot personality or person, legal personality of AI. Uh, and last month, Australia and South Africa in the space of a week uh, recognized AI systems as quote unquote inventors for the purposes of patent law. Uh, and, and this is a live debate whether that's, that's appropriate. Uh, it's worth highlighting they did not say, the courts did not say that the AI system could own a patent, um, but that it could be recognized as an inventor. So there's a lot of people working on this area. This is a map that David Gunkel has come up with trying to position various individuals on, on the question of robot rights. Um, and, uh, and that's something else we could talk about in discussion if people are interested. Uh, but really, I'm very keen to uh, get into uh, discussion to hear what all of you think, uh, what questions you might have, and hopefully have a rich discussion over the next uh, little while. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, as I said, looking forward to a rich discussion. Thanks. I think Marcelo is going to come back. Uh, there he is. Um, and then we're going to have a discussion. And then there are some questions coming up in the in the Q&A function, I think. Yes, yes. So, uh... Please, uh, all of you, feel free to uh, type in your questions. We are more than happy to uh, to entertain them. Uh, I'll just break the ice here, uh, asking uh, Simon some questions. And I really enjoyed the presentation uh, uh, and reading the book. Uh, it, it was just fascinating. It is just so interesting to see uh, how things start to come together from uh, 
as an evolution from earlier debates on regulation of the internet, regulation of cyberspace, uh, um, how things evolve and consolidate in a new direction, but at the same time revisiting uh, old questions uh, about the role of the state in regulating uh, the internet. Now we have questions about the role of the state uh, in regulating AI. Uh, and what I enjoyed particularly about the book is that it has a positive message. I think it has a positive message about human beings, a, po a positive message about humankind and our uh, in enduring place uh, uh, in the world. Uh, there are questions which are questions uh, concerns with uh, efficiency, but the book also points to uh, concerns which are more deontic, deontological concerns, issues of, uh, of morality when decisions shouldn't be delegated. Uh, you mentioned the case of the killer robots, uh, for instance, uh, and, uh, or, or issues of legitimacy, where even if the decisions could be uh, efficiently made uh, by an AI system, they shouldn't be delegated to an AI system, cases where courts, uh, for instance, should be making uh, uh, the decision. Uh, the, the first question that I would like to ask, having this, this background of, uh, of, of the individual, of, of human beings, uh, as uh, the, the, the enduring locus of, uh, 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 of decision-making uh, in issues which are moral issues, uh, issues which are uh, issues in, uh, related to questions of legitimacy and the role of the state. Uh, there has been a lot of debates. There's a huge literature uh, pointing to uh, perhaps a transition from a moment which is an era, which we are still in, which is modernity, uh, uh, to a movement towards some, something else. Uh, uh, the idea of modernity assuming uh, the, uh, the rationality of the individual as a focus on human rationality, the possibility of knowing. Uh, uh, modernity is, the idea of modernity is also founded upon the uh, the authority uh, of the nation state, which we, we attempt to justify uh, by resorting to certain theories, let's say uh, a social contract, or contractarian theories. Uh, I read the book in a way as a reaffirmation uh, of the modern ideal, rather than a view that we are transitioning uh, into something else. Uh, the, the, the concern that exists uh, often uh, is, uh, uh, relates to ideas of postmodernity, how the pillars uh, of regulation uh, on which uh, the authority of the state is founded uh, is being uh, uh, increasingly eroded by new forms of regulation coming from the market, coming from technology, which is, is seen as displacing uh, uh, the role of the state and, and even the, 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 the possibilities uh, of uh, individuals understanding and dealing with reality uh, uh, and regulating their own situation. Uh, would, you, would you say that uh, um, artificial intelligence in any way uh, moves us to another, another era, another era? Uh, or do we, do we still remain uh, within the modern paradigm? Is human rationality still at the core, still at the center? Is the nation state still uh, at the center as uh, uh, an institution that represents us? Uh, or yeah. increasingly seeing this being eroded uh, and new forms of power, authority emerging uh, which with last possibilities of accountability uh, and uh, and control. Yeah, so I mean that's a fascinating sort of question. So let me let me talk briefly about the state and then a bit about rationality. So on the state, I mean I, I studied international relations and then international law through the 1990s, which was a time when there was great optimism about the death of the state. And the idea was that environmental pressures from above, human rights pressures from below, the pressures of the market was just reducing the role of these sort of 17th century institutions, which were no longer fit for purpose. The problem is we realized, I think around the end of that decade, the start of the 2000s, that while it was true that states were outdated, while it was true that states are the primary violators of human rights, 
they are the least bad political structure for achieving any kind of rights. Uh, and so we need institutions of the state. We need functioning public institutions if we are to guard against the benefits, uh, guard against the, the, the terrors of the, the sort of Hobbesian state of nature, but also if we're going to achieve anything in that sort of contractarian uh, ideal. And I'm, I'm very much involved in, uh, I'm very much um, uh, a supporter of that. I mean, the subtitle of my book on surveillance a decade ago was a, a new social contract to defend freedom without sacrificing liberty. Uh, and so I, I think we do need states. And part of the message of the book is really a pushback against those who would say, just leave it to the market. The market will work everything out. Well, markets can work some things out, but markets, markets don't care if you live or die. The market is, uh, is an efficiency machine. But my slide on regulation highlights that market efficiency is one reason for government regulation, uh, but not the only one. Uh, so if you had a market for the, where, that told you that discrimination was a good thing, you still shouldn't do it, even if it's inefficient. So I, I'm a believer in state institutions. On rationality, I mean, this is, I mean, this is one of the great challenges of this century, I think. And I'm sort of less worried in the near term about an artificial general intelligence, the, the kind of Nick Bostrom super intelligence taking over the world than I am what it will mean when we infuse ourselves with technology. And so Facebook is doing this stuff on the metaverse. There is an increasing tendency for young people, especially to feel comfortable interacting online and not in person. I, I do worry about what that does to our conception of ourselves, the way in which we interact with the world. Uh, and then the, the last thing I'll say about rationality is that on this question of artificial general intelligence, the sort of Turing test uh, and so on, one of the things that I find fascinating is that the more we sort of push at the limits of artificial general intelligence, the more it reveals how little we understand our own intelligence. And certainly if you start talking about robot consciousness, there's not even an agreement on what human consciousness means. So I think that that question of rationality uh, is going to remain front and center, uh, but uh, it's going to be put under stress, uh, not necessarily by robots taking over the world, but rather revealing how little we understand our own place in it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think that points to attention at, at the same time. Uh, and I'm fully on board uh, with you here on the evolution of, of regulation as well as and, and of our expectations in relation to the state. Right? Uh, if we see the internet from the, from the mid 90s, the Clinton idea that to regulate the internet would be like to try to stick jello to the wall. Uh, to the kind of concerns that we have ensuing from the Cambridge Analytica scandal, the, the tacklash uh, that we have been uh, going through uh, uh, in, the, in the past two decades. Uh, uh, there, there has been a, 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 a seismic shift uh, in how we understand and how do we deal uh, with uh, technology. But at the same time, there is a tension here. Uh, if we recognize the increasing role uh, of the state and how our expectations should be directed mostly uh, uh, to the state. Uh, and one of the, I think the first question uh, that we've got here uh, was exactly a question about surveillance. Uh, uh, in a world of, of surveillance, aiding uh, with AI it sometimes feels, feels helpless to limit the evasion of privacy, especially in a non-democratic world. Uh, uh, how do we protect ourselves against surveillance, especially from the state? Yeah. Uh, I think that the, ten the tension here uh, is at the same time that we expect more from the state, uh, what, what then uh, are the, the limits uh, to, uh, to state authority? The idea that technology challenges and changes the balances of freedoms between positives and, and, and negative freedoms. Uh, uh, and I think this distinction uh, we see throughout uh, uh, the book, right? reflected throughout the book, this, uh, uh, this balance uh, and uh, how far should the state go? You, you engage with ideas of speed bumps, circuit breakers, right? attempts to reduce uh, speed, uh, uh, to program a different sense uh, of time. But at the same time, the question of when to intervene, you engage with the issue of the calling ridge dilemma, which you... Uh, 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 revisited now uh, uh, in your presentation. Uh, 
And I think the big the big elephant in the room, not which you address to some extent in the book, I think it's it's always China, uh, which was the 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 internet how it was uh, uh, in the in the mid nineties uh, and how it how it is evolving to be. Uh, uh, an internet with more presence uh, of regulation by the state, for instance, in relation to fake news, and uh, uh, and the, the internet increasingly starts to look like something different. Uh, and I think the same uh, kinds of questions are raised here uh, in relation to AI. So I think that's the second uh, question after this long uh, 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 introduction here to the point is just. Uh, what do you, do you think then are the, the limits to to, uh, to state authority? If it, you present the issue as a political issue, not only a legal issue, but at the heart of it, it's a political question. Right? Courts should decide, uh, even if the decisions by the machine uh, uh, would be better, because it's 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 a political uh, a question, a question of sovereignty. Right? Then what are the limits? Yeah. So. Um... So the, the way in which I tend to think about this is the there's a lot of misconceptions of AI that think about autonomy of AI systems in the sense of the machine taking decisions for itself, when what we really mean when we talk about autonomy is that a human is not taking that decision. Uh, and that's why it becomes problematic. Uh, and so there's a, there's a nice doctrine in the United States called inherently governmental functions. Uh, and this is the idea, at least for the purposes of US federal law, that there are certain, certain decisions that not, should not be outsourced. Uh, and that's usually thought of in the, in the sense of outsourcing to companies. Um, but I think the same idea can be applied to AI. In the context of companies, for example, this is used when uh, imposing limits on outsourcing of war fighting functions to mercenaries or private military security companies, or outsourcing intelligence gathering functions or outsourcing decisions about the rights and obligations of individuals. And I think it's, to me at least, pretty obvious that if you shouldn't be able to, if a government shouldn't be able to outsource a decision to a company, it shouldn't be able to outsource it to a machine either. That the reason we vote for, or well, the reason why some political process uh, appoints a government official, the reason why they can raise taxes uh, is so that they can take decisions on our behalf and be held accountable in some form um, for those decisions. Now, back to uh, entirely appropriately, the first question about surveillance was from anonymous attendee. Uh, what, what should citizens do in this situation? Well, I mean, my previous work on surveillance, I was always very pessimistic about the idea that, that there was much hope left for privacy. The idea that you could keep yourself insulated from the state, that you could have a, a sphere of activity that was truly your own, those days I think are long gone. I mean, it's possible. You can turn off your computer, turn off your phone, don't use a credit card, don't use a loyalty card and so on, but it's pretty miserable. Um, the better question is how we use that information and how governments are allowed to use that information. And so one of the challenges here, uh, and it's the link between personal data and AI, is AI requires a lot of data to, to sort of be, uh, to be effective, to develop good models. Um, and you mentioned China. One of the reasons why China is such a powerhouse in AI uh, is precisely because it's got so much data, uh, because personal data protection laws were at least until recently very weak um, because the Chinese government didn't regard that as priority. Uh, and so you had the ability to vacuum up vast amounts of information, the whole social credit system uh, in a way that in other jurisdictions would be completely uh, well, at least would be very uh, problematic, would be challenged. Um, and so what are the limits for the state? This is going to have to be worked out on a state-by-state -state basis. I mean, when I say some of these questions are political, that means there is no answer. Uh, it's an answer that's got to be worked out based on the political dynamic of a particular uh, community. Although I do argue that in addition to that sort of state level regulation, some thin layer of international regulation on those red lines would be helpful. Uh, while at the same time acknowledging that a lot of the day-to-day -day operations really will be various forms of self-regulation, the development of standards and industry self-restraint. Uh, and that's maybe a, a time to pivot on to some of the other questions that the origin of a lot of my own work here came from getting to know computer scientists who were doing this sort of cutting edge technology. And then every now and then they'd lift their head up and realize, hey, no one expects me to understand all the real world consequences of me solving this little technical problem. Uh, and it was in conversations like that that I realized, okay, 
One, you can't expect a computer scientist to predict the privacy implications a decade hence uh, of his or her research. Uh, but two, if the lawyers are going to get involved, the lawyers need to have that conversation with the technologists, with the specialists about how to sort of get the benefits of the problem that they're working on, the solution they're working on, while mitigating the long-term risks. Thank you very much. Uh, and not, uh, another uh, question uh, that uh, I think I'm, I'm going to just go to the questions by the audience. Uh, just one uh, final point here. There are so many things that I would like to ask, but uh, we have so many questions to entertain as well, and it's just fair. Uh, it's only fair that we we'll move on. Uh, and you you talk about uh, so just two issues. One is about the move from transparency to explainability. Uh, and uh, if you could just, because I think this is a very important point. If you could just uh, 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 unpack this uh, here uh, uh, to the audience. Uh, what, what is the difference between transparency uh, and explainability? And is, and is explainability uh, practicable? Uh, is it something that uh, is achievable? And I think that is a central issue uh, uh, in the book and a central concern with AI. And the second point that I would uh, I ask you just to uh, 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 engage with here as well is your propo proposal uh, of an international uh, artificial intelligence agency, which I, I found uh, was uh, particularly interesting. So what, what would this uh, agency uh, be responsible for? Okay, so so trying to be brief so we can get to the questions. So transparency, um, so transparency is best understood by saying, well, what is it, what is it the opposite of? Why do we care about transparency? I think this is one of the questions that came up. We care about transparency um, partly to guard against really, really dumb decisions. Uh, so if you, if you don't understand a process, you don't understand the quality of the process. Uh, and so one reason why I think transparency is often beneficial is that the more light we shine on a problem, the more we understand it, hopefully we get to better decisions. Um, so that's, that's one type of um, transparency. A second is to guard against impermissible decisions. Uh, and so that means that if a machine learning system is, for example, coming up with a decision and then we reveal that it's based on bias of some form, um, then that's problematic in a second way. If it's, if it's racist or it's sexist, then that, that's a problem. And you won't always pick this up if you're only looking at individual explanations. Um, if you look at one decision, for example, to hire a woman or a man, um, and the man gets hired, was that biased? Well, on one decision, it's quite hard to work out. But if you look at, like, as Amazon's resume screening algorithm famously did, um, if you look at 10 years of decisions uh, and you reveal bias, uh, then if a machine learning system operates on the basis of that past data, it's going to keep on being biased. And then the third reason why I think transparency is valuable uh, is when and this is the example of judges, when the legitimacy of the decision depends not on just the, the rightness of a decision, but on the process by which that decision was reached. So a judge, in many common law jurisdictions in particular, a judge who makes a decision without reasoning, uh, that decision can be appealed just because there weren't reasons that were given. Um, now, how is all this different from explainability? The problem with explainability is it's limited and it's ex post facto, limited uh, because the way in which we usually understand explainability is a decision has been made uh, and then you or someone in your, your position asks for reasons why that decision was made. A couple of problems with this. One, moving forward, there are going to be millions upon millions of decisions made about us by AI systems on a regular basis. So it's unrealistic for us to expect to uh, explain each of those ones. Uh, but secondly, the most likely situation in which we're only going to be bothered to ask a question uh, is when we get the decision we don't like. So in, situ in simple situations like you didn't get a bank loan, you weren't chosen for a job, you might ask for a reason, but that's not going to be practical on a regular basis. So that, that's why I think you need transparency for certain classes of decisions rather than just relying on explainability. The International Artificial Intelligence Agency is, is an idea uh, more of an idea, a thought experiment than a practical proposal. Uh, and this is modeled on the International Atomic Energy Agency, where um, if you go back to around the same time that Asimov was writing his short stories, you had the genesis of nuclear energy. 
And the scientists involved in nuclear energy knew at the time uh, that it had the benefit, the, the prospect of enormous benefit for humanity in terms of energy production, agriculture, medicine, and of course, obviously for destruction. Uh, and so the IAEA was an attempt to forge a grand bargain where the nuclear powers would agree to share non-weapon technology with the rest of the world in exchange for a promise that the rest of the world wouldn't develop nuclear weapons. And so the thought experiment in the book is, well, could we do something similar with AI, where you disseminate widely the benefits of AI with a promise not to weaponize it, either narrowly in the sense of lethal autonomous weapons or more broadly in terms of uh, developing uncontainable, uncontrollable AI systems. Thanks a lot. I think we need to go through the, uh, we have a, a set of questions here, some of which we have uh, answered. Uh, you have answered the question by my colleague, Clement Chen, uh, related to uh, explainability. I think that was the point that you have uh, just made. Uh, in your view, has the proposed European Commission AI law engaged with the metric of managed risks, red lines, and process legitimacy adequately? So the Europeans have a particular take on this. I think there are there's a lot to chew over in the draft regulation. A lot of the focus is perhaps understandably, uh, it's not directly on artificial intelligence. A lot of it's really on personal data. Uh, and so facial surveillance in particular gets mentioned. I think the idea of um, an accountability type based approach having to justify the use, I mean, this is one of the one of the most important moves in data protection uh, that we could potentially see in AI. I mean, data protection for most of the last 20 or 30 years has been premised on this artificial notion of consent. And the dirty secret of data protection is everyone knows that's not fit for purpose. That in theory, every time you click accept uh, for an end user license agreement or terms and conditions on the use of your personal data, there's a thousand, maybe it's 7,000 word set of um, uh, text, a text that you are agreeing to. Now, if we were in a room, I would ask you to put your hands up if you read all of those terms and conditions. None of you would put your hands up. I've written books on data protection. I don't read those terms and conditions. Uh, and so that's a completely unrealistic way to regulate data protection. So what we're moving towards there is a move towards accountability, where the onus is not on the individual to consent in some kind of contractual arrangement for the use of their data, but on companies to justify the use of their data. The EU draft legislation um, is a step in that direction in terms of AI, and that I think is a, is a very positive move. move. But, uh, but as, as the, the slide highlighted earlier, there's already pushback from industry saying, oh, this will just drive industry away from the European Union. So, so watch that space. Thank you very much. A further question here by my uh, colleague, Julian Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, you've briefly, Professor Chesterman, you've briefly talked about certain roles and tasks not being given to AI, such as judges and their judicial role. With a supposedly impending singularity event, what do you think will be the impact on regulation and law with AI plus and AI plus plus? That's a, that's a great question, Ji Yun. Um, so one, one of the things, one of the other things I take aim at in the book is the so-called Android fallacy. I didn't come up with that term, but it's the idea, again, partly attributable to Asimov, um, that when there is AI, uh, general artificial intelligence, it'll be humanoid in form and kind of human level in intellect. Uh, whereas the reality is much more likely that if we ever produce an AI system that has general intelligence at the level of a dog, it's not going to go dog level intelligence, um, average human Albert Einstein, it's going to go dog level intelligence, and then it's going to overtake us completely. Um, and so in the book, what I, what I do talk about is, although I'm against the idea of artificial intelligence being granted legal personality, I'm against it for two and a half reasons. The two reasons being, um, I don't think it helps in terms of blaming people when things go wrong. I don't think it's entitled to the benefits when things go right. But the half reason is that if we ever do get to the point of AI equaling us, it'll very quickly surpass us. Uh, and in that situation, uh, if we had granted legal personality, the history of legal personality shows that uh, most jurisdictions expand legal personality rather than take it away. And so if we do, uh, I say this as a thought experiment because this is decades, at least in the future, 
if we did grant some kind of rights and recognition to AI, the best reason for that is in the hope, fingers crossed, that when it takes over, it does the same for us. Thank you. One, uh, one question which I think is important here relates to the issue of compass that you engage uh, in the tale with in the book. Uh, so you mentioned that some decisions should not be outsourced to AI. What do you think of the use of compass, a software that uses an algorithm to assess potential recidivism risk in some US courts? So Jessica, thanks for the question. You're gonna like chapter five, um, which talks about um, the, uh, sorry, chapter three rather, that talks about um, opacity and compass. So compass is a, an algorithm that, well, it's a computer program that predicts the likelihood that a def an offender will re-offend. And there's the case, uh, Mr. Eric Loomis, uh, who was sentenced based on, um, on ideas that he couldn't challenge. Uh, and so it went all the way to the US Supreme Court uh, which declined to hear the case. And so the, the Wisconsin Supreme Court's decision was upheld, essentially saying that the decision stood uh, because it couldn't be proven that the judge had solely relied on compass uh, because the judge had said, well, there are other factors that encourage me to agree with this compass finding of a high rate of recidivism, high risk of recidivism. The problem with that is um, that there's a lot of literature showing that when uh, a, an AI system or a computer system almost of any kind makes a recommendation, many of us are inclined to agree with it on the assumption that the computer knows more than we do. And if that decision is opaque, we've got no basis for making that assessment of its competence. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply wary of outsourcing that kind of decision uh, to AI systems. Now, against that, some people would argue that at least AI systems are consistent. At least AI systems, if you ask an AI system, if you interrogate it, say, are you biased? It will try to give you a correct answer. Uh, and so that's actually been one of the positive sides of, uh, of, of machine learning systems is that if used properly, it can reveal our biases, uh, but that's revealing human biases uh, rather than introducing machine biases. But this, this is linked with the larger question, I think, of why I think uh, that judicial functions in particular should not be outsourced to machines. And I mean, we talked earlier about the political legitimacy question, but there's also a jurisprudential argument that if, uh, if, if you drill down into a, a machine learning system, what it's really doing is an elaborate series of something a bit like regression analyses, which is very good for making predictions based on past behavior. And so if, for example, you had a hypothetical perfect AI judge, machine judge that had all of the past precedent available, um, it could then take decisions in a new case based on that past precedent. Now, in addition to that political argument that a judge should take the decision, the jurisprudential argument against a machine doing that is that the law changes. And that's a good thing. Because if you uh, take the thought experiment, if we did this 100 years ago uh, and put an AI system in charge of judicial decision making to make decisions based on how everything had been decided in the past, uh, then you would have reified, you would have reaffirmed all of the discriminatory practices that with the benefit of a century's hindsight, we realized that we didn't treat women, people of color, people with disabilities, people from different backgrounds equally. Uh, and so if you believe, as I do, that law is an inherently contested space that has to change, that shouldn't remain static, then handing things over to a machine, a bit like the way we use computer systems to predict the weather, uh, only makes sense if you basically regard the law as like the weather, something outside of human control. Uh, and I don't believe that, which is why I don't think machines should be put in charge. Uh, just one final question combining. You have a, a, a three different questions in relation to uh, the boundaries between uh, innovation and private interests uh, and uh, state intervention. Uh, so there is a, a question about trade secrets, wh whether uh, uh, AI should be regulated as a trade secret, which is an approach that is said to be taken by some uh, jurisdictions. Uh, the last question, uh, how come that we allow individuals to privately own AI forever? Uh, so there is a question of ownership here. Uh, and so that I think that the, and there was also uh, another question uh, about how we can preserve innovation. Uh, 
preserve uh, private interests. So, how what, what should be are the limits to uh, ownership of artificial uh, artificial intelligent systems? Uh, are there obligations that come from uh, this ownership? Are the boundaries? Uh, how far should the state go uh, uh, in this regard? Yeah, I mean, this is this is linked with my sort of red line on transparency. That I, I suppose, in some ways, it's the flip side of the question uh, that AI systems should be attributable to a, a traditional legal person, um, whether you, whether that's due to ownership or control or being the manufacturer. Um, I'm, I'm agnostic. My concern is not that humans will own AI. My concern is that you'll have AI systems operating in the wild, not attributable to a, a human or a corporate actor uh, or at the international level to a state. Uh, and the reason that's a, a concern uh, is that if you have these sort of unattributable things out in the wild, uh, it becomes ever easier and indeed uh, quite attractive to have a kind of deniability. Um, and that can obviously be used for terrorist type purposes and, and that will be something we'll be grappling with much as in the nuclear context, uh, we worry about uh, misuse of nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, again, one of the reasons why I draw on the IAEA as a model for the IAIA that I'm proposing is that there has been intergovernmental agreement that the problem with nuclear weapons uh, is partly one of being able to trace them back uh, so that there are sort of registers of nuclear providers, nuclear suppliers. Um, and, and so if we could apply that to AI, that would be helpful in, uh, in either at least being able to attribute action to particular individuals or maybe to mitigate the risks of misuse. The difficulty, and this goes back to the trade secrets question, the ownership question, is that the cost of entry of AI are, are, are quite low. Uh, and that unlike nuclear energy, nuclear energy uh, depends on, a, a, it's reasonably sophisticated technology. It depends on a limited amount of materials that are readily easily identified. Uh, none of those limitations really apply to AI. Uh, and so that's going to be a regulatory challenge in its own right as we look forward into the future. So the hope is that regulators are aware of this. The hope is that regulators are paying attention at this early stage and will be able to thread that needle or ne negotiate that kind of Goldilocks regulatory model where we don't unnecessarily constrain innovation because I'm a big believer in the impact of technology and helping achieve the sustainable development goals, um, realize um, human potential that we can achieve all those things uh, while at the same time mitigating against the risks of uh, the sort of misuse of AI, the abuse of AI, or just the inequitable distribution of AI that means that all of the benefits get arrogated to a very small few, most likely um, companies, uh, without distributing it to the rest of us. Thank you very much, Simon, uh, uh, for this uh, uh, excellent uh, presentation. We have so many questions uh, still there. I, I'm sure uh, 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 Professor Chessman will be delighted to entertain them uh, in a future occasion or if you like, uh, would like to drop him a line. So thank all of you for uh, joining us uh, today. Uh, and thank you so much, Simon, for, uh, for joining us, uh, for presenting on your book. And I'm, I'm sure it will be of great interest uh, uh, to all the attendees and, 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 and to make a great impact uh, in the field. Uh, I, I wish this presentation could, could have happened uh, indeed in, in person, uh, uh, but I look forward to having you here with us uh, in a future occasion and to visit you uh, likewise there uh, uh, in Singapore. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed and appreciate uh, uh, you, you joining us today. Thanks, Marcelo. I join you in looking forward to catching up in person. And indeed, thank you to so many people who took part and asked the really interesting questions, which I'm going to get a copy of this and go through some of them myself uh, more slowly. But thank you, everyone, for paying attention. And uh, I look forward to future discussions on this topic. It's not going anywhere soon. <laughs> for sure. Uh, and I'd also like to thank, uh, on behalf uh, 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 of the Alliance Technology Center, uh, uh, your uh, presence here. And I would also like to thank my colleagues at the Center for uh, organizing the event today. So Grace, uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, organization. Uh, and I look forward to being in touch. Thank you so much once again, Simon. Thanks very much. Have a great day, everyone.